Hello again, everyone, and thanks for joining us in, for another particular live webinar. This is Mauro Servienti. Today, I'm joined by my colleague and distributed system geek, Adam Ralph, who is going to talk about discovering the hidden boundaries in your systems. Adam, welcome. Thank you very much, Mauro. And thank you to everyone who's joined us uh, today. Really appreciate you spending the next hour uh, listening to me talk about service boundaries. Uh, I've been looking forward to this, and I hope you're going to find it enjoyable and useful. So for those of you who don't know me, my name's Adam, and uh, I'm originally from the UK. Uh, these days I live in Switzerland, up in the mountains, and I've worked for particular software for about four years now. Now, I guess you're at least somewhat familiar with, uh, with particular software and who we are and what we do. We make a product called N Service Bus. I'm not going to talk much about that today, uh, but what, what I will say is that our company mission is to help organizations get better at delivering complex software systems. Now, in doing that, we tend to talk to a lot of people. So we talk to uh, customers, we talk to uh, people at conferences, uh, we have support cases. And we have a lot of interesting conversations, and a lot of those tend to center around problems with systems, and specifically around shuffling data around versioning components, uh, deploying things together. And it's very often in those conversations that uh, we find ourselves thinking, you know what, if the service boundaries were slightly different, we may not even have, have to have this conversation. So the problem that we're talking about may not even exist. So that's the reason I think it's really important to, find, to talk about finding a right service boundaries, because for me, it's one of those things that sometimes is at the root of many problems. So if you think that this problem, if you get the wrong service boundaries, that can cause other problems and they cause other problems and so forth. So it's somewhere near, it, the kind of root cause of a lot of the problems we see. Now, today I'm probably, and I intend to take uh, some of the typical things that we've learned in the software industry. So some of the things we're familiar with and things we may have learned uh, um, in computer science degrees and uh, various literature that we've read. And I, I do, I do, I will kind of take those apart and tear them up and kind of turn things upside down. Um, if any of you have heard me talk before, you know that's something I like to do. So I am expecting that to raise questions. So as Maris said, please do use the Q&A to, to ask me uh, anything you like about this as we go along. So let's start off by looking at a system. Now, this is really any system, it doesn't really, ma ma really matter what it is. It doesn't really matter what these boxes are either. They could be classes, they could be functions, uh, procedures. It doesn't really matter. But we do tend to structure our systems in this kind of way. So we don't tend to write program.main and then just put everything in that main method. At least I hope you don't do that. I and mean, that's something that I used to do back in the 80s when I taught myself programming. But these days, things have moved on a bit. We do tend to structure our programs so that we have certain areas of, of responsibility. So you could look at this and let's just assume that these are, these are classes for argument's sake. You might think, well, there's an area up here in the system which clearly has some kind of uh, area of responsibility. You know, this, this group of classes is doing something. Um, this smaller group of classes down here is doing something as well. And this actually looks quite nice. Okay, so you can you can kind of see that um, certain components depend on other components, and things are kind of structured fairly nicely. You can kind of follow things along from this kind of diagram and find out where responsibilities belong. Now that's all well and good, but the problem is that businesses have this nasty habit. They have this nasty habit of coming along with new requirements, and you might come to work one day and uh, one of the partners or someone might come into your into your uh, area of the company and just say look i've i've had this fantastic new idea we, i was out playing golf with my buddies this weekend and we think we've got this great new thing that we can do and we think we can make a ton of money out of this 
and explain it to you and you think, well, I think we can do this. I think, uh, yeah, I, I know how we can do this. But you realize that what you actually need is in some component up here, let's say this class up here, you need some data that's in a class down here. So you take a look at the diagram and you think, well, how are we going to do this? Can we, do we need to kind of change the diagram around? We kind of redraw the lines and juggle things around? Or do we just make the call from this class to this class? Now, remember, at this point, we may be dealing with, say, an object-oriented program. A program. This might be, these might be C-sharp classes. And ultimately, this is what C-sharp classes and classes in other languages are designed to do. They have a nicely defined interface. You know, they're encapsulating some kind of behavior. And our architectural constraint, which is object-oriented programming, is telling us that this is a valid call. So even though it kind of doesn't really quite fit in with the diagram right now, you think, well, let's just try this on for size. Let's do this. Let's make this change. And you roll that into production, and things tend to work. And the business is happy because they are making more money as a result of their new feature. And you know, you get your praise, and you know, it's a job well done. Sooner or later, the missus might come along to you again, and they might say, well, you know, I was out jet skiing last weekend at my summer house, and I had this fantastic new idea. We're going to make a ton of new money. Uh, but what we actually need is some data up here, which is contained in the class down here. And you think back to the last time you did that. You think, well, that thing we did a couple of weeks ago, that worked out pretty well, right? It's working in production, hasn't caused any bugs. Um, the feature's working as intended. So you think, well, let's just do the same thing again then. Let's just you know, respect our object orientation, respect our class interfaces, and let's make another call again. And you roll it into production and things go smoothly again. Sooner or later, you end up doing the same thing. You end up making a call from some other class or some other class. You realize uh, you need to basically follow the same pattern. And it has been working out quite well for you if you go for it again. Now, I can guess where, I, I guess you can kind of see where I might be heading with this now. The thing is that no one really sets out to make a mess. But given enough time, and it could be a large amount of time, it could be a few months, it could be six months, it could be a year, even more, you may slowly start to end up with something which looks a little bit more like this. Now, the problem here is that this diagram starts to lose its usefulness uh, because you might turn around to your colleague and say, oh, yeah, you know that new feature we rolled out last week? Did you use a system diagram for that? And they'll say to you, what, you mean that thing with all the red lines all over it? No, nah, that's pretty useless. I haven't used that for weeks. So what that's telling you is that these lines have kind of lost their meaning because you can't really use this diagram in any meaningful way. You may as well just take the lines away and just have a bunch of boxes. Now, at this point, these things are still classes. So they still have their interfaces, their, you know, their, some level of encapsulation. But the only way to really make changes to the system is to kind of like try it and see, you know, kind of um, some people call this an edit and pray method of making changes. So you kind of go into one class and you, you make some changes you think are required. Then you find out that that class is used by other classes. So you end up on this kind of, sometimes it can feel like you're going a bit down the rabbit hole or you're going on a kind of code safari where you're discovering as you go along what you might break and what you might not break. and and in the end, what that means is that you can't really use this diagram very meaningfully either because you can't look at one box in this diagram and say, oh, yeah, that's the thing we need to change. That the thing, that's the thing which encapsulates that, that behavior. In order to, to deliver this new feature, we're going to change that class. So what that says then is the individual boxes aren't much use either because you always have to just go exploring anyway. So you may as well just draw one big box. Now, at this point, this is what some people recognize as something which we sometimes call the big ball of mud. Now, judging by your poll questions, uh, your poll answers at the beginning of the webinar, um, I saw that uh, many of you have seen systems which are tending towards this throughout your careers. I think the, the most common answer for average systems over your career was something around the two mark on the one to five scale. <laughs> 
So I guess you're all reasonably familiar with uh, the Big Born and Bud architecture. During my career, I think this is probably the most common system architecture that I've seen, uh, which is a sad thing to say, but it's the unfortunate truth. The thing is, we, we know that we can do better than this. So we read about things like service-oriented service -oriented architecture and microservices. Um, I'll come to microservices services specifically a little bit later. And we read that it's better to split our system up into some kind of notion of independent services or some kind of components. And what we really want to do with services is we want to have thin lines of communication between them. I'll come to more, uh, more on this in a, in a minute. But what we, what we want is loose coupling between these services. Now, that all looks fine. But what tends to happen is a business will come along with a new requirement, they'll say, you know, I was out jogging this morning, I had a, a great idea for this new feature, I think we can make a load of new money. And you take a look at your services and you think, okay, yes, I think we can do this. But what we need is some data from the service on the top left in the service on the top right. And this might be something really innocuous. It might be something like um, a price. So, you know, widget X costs $100. How much harm can that do? You know, it's just a number going across the wire. So you think, okay, well, we're going to adjust the interface between those two services slightly, and we're going to introduce this notion of a price. Um, that's still uh, a low amount of coupling. Uh, it seems uh, like it's, it's not going to do much harm. So you make that change, you roll it into production, and everyone's happy again and you are making more money and you've delivered the feature. Sooner or later, the business will come in again with this great new feature. You know, I was out, uh, I don't know, snowboarding last weekend and I had this great new idea. And you realize you need to do the similar thing again and you just share some data between two more services again. And again, it might be something really innocuous. It might be something like um, quantity of items in stock. So 100 widgets. So you know, an integer number going across the wire, we alter our service interface to provide this new integer, and we roll out, that, roll out that change and everything's fine again. But you can guess where I'm going with this again. So given enough time, and it might be a long period of time, it might be months, six months, a year, 18 months, you may start to end up with something which looks a little bit more like this. And again, no one sets out to do this. The problem is that things, things can kind of atrophy to this kind of state and we can end up in a very bad situation again where we've already seen that we may as well get rid of the boxes, we may as well get rid of the lines, and we're kind of back to a big ball of mud situation. Only this time, it's a big ball of mud with a slight difference because you've split this up into four nominally called services and you've rolled those out onto four different machines. Now, those machines are talking to each other over the network. And even if that's local host, it's still a lot more expensive than in-memory class-to-class calls. You may have to roll out two, three, or even all four of them at the same time because they're tightly coupled. You know, remember the lines back here. It's very difficult to imagine a scenario where we can roll out one service independent of the other because they're relying on data from each other so much. So what's happened is You've reached for an architectural approach that was supposed to help and make things better. And you can in fact end up in a much worse situation than you ended up with and you started off with. You know, this is what sometimes people refer to as the distributed ball of mud. So it pretends to be services. It's really just another big ball of mud with some extra complications thrown in with this deployment to different machines and talking over the network. So how can we avoid this? So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take a use case. I'm, going to, I'm actually going to take a, a, real, a real use case of you know, what we're going to do with the system and examine how we can work towards doing this and avoid getting into this situation. Now, if you've heard me talk before, you may have seen that I like to use the example of Amazon. Um, Amazon's a good example because Amazon is a very service-oriented uh, company. In fact, it's probably one of the most service-oriented companies in the world. Uh, there's this famous um, 
thing about uh, Jeff Bezos, the CEO, who sent out a internal memo, and he basically instructed everyone in the company to build everything around a kind of service-oriented architecture. And he said uh, that anyone found not doing so will be fired. Right? That actually happened. So as a result of that, Amazon has become a very service-oriented company. Um, there is certainly not one, a one terabyte Amazon.exe which gets deployed. Now, Amazon is also a good choice because uh, I'm sure most of us are familiar with buying something on Amazon or a similar site. Uh, Amazon's not available in every country. But when you buy something on Amazon, what you do is you kind of enter into a workflow. So once you've gone through the product catalog and you've decided what lovely shiny things you want to buy, you put them in your basket, you then say, right, I'm going to go ahead and buy now. I'm going to go and spend the money. So you click proceed to checkout, and that in itself starts a certain workflow. The first step in that workflow might be to enter a delivery address. The second step might be to enter my payment methods. And then there are other things around shipping options and uh, other things. And when we get to the end of that workflow, we click buy now. And that effectively completes the workflow. Now, let's take a look behind the scenes. And this is a, let's say, slightly simplified version of the Amazon backend. I'm not going to describe exactly how that works. But we can imagine that we may have services split up into the, 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 the notions of sales, finance, and shipping. Now, when we've got to, to the end of our workflow, we click place order. So at that point, we might send a message to sales to say place order. Then sales does whatever process it needs to do. So uh, things like, are we still selling this product? Are we allowed to sell it to this country? Um, if we have none left, can we get more from the supplier? Um, have we got any inventory left? That kind of salesy type stuff. If all of that's satisfied, it says, right, the order's good to go. So we're gonna send a message to finance and to shipping to say the order's been placed, right? My work is done. Now it's over to you. Finance might say, okay, well, I need to go and do my stuff now. I need to go and do my financy stuff, like um, billing the customer is the obvious one. So this might be charging their credit card or some other method of payment. Finance will then say, okay, I'm all done. I've taken the money. And it sends an order build message to shipping. and says, over to you. Now, because shipping has received the message from sales to say the order's been placed, and it's received the message from finance to say that the order's been billed, it knows that it can do its stuff. So it does shipping-y kind of stuff. It says, where am I going to ship this order? Uh, which courier am I going to call? Or which postal service? And it actually gets the thing out of the door and on its way to the customer. At that point, it might send the message, say, which says order ship to some other kind of service which does something else like, I don't know, aggregate some kind of like marketing information or send the customer an email or whatever. Now, the question is, what should each of these uh, messages contain? So when we kind of send this message called order placed from sales to shipping, we can say that's an event to say that the order has been placed. So this event has happened. Now, should that event contain all the information that shipping needs in order to ship the order. So should it create, should it contain the address and all the rest of it and all the shipping options? Should that order place event contain all the information that finance needs in order to build the customer? So in other words, should it contain the credit card details and all the rest of it? Now that would work. Okay. There's no reason that wouldn't work, but there's an inherent problem with that. The problem is that if we want to change something in the system, we're going to have to change it in more than one place. So for example, what if we wanted to introduce Bitcoin payment? We'd have to make a whole bunch of changes in finance to, ch to charge in Bitcoin. And we'd have to have, have a whole bunch of changes in sales to, so that it understood what information it needed to gather to put on the event to send to finance. 
very similar with shipping. What if we wanted to um, ship uh, ebooks? You don't ship a, an ebook to a physical address. I mean, you could on a kind of USB key or something, but that'd just be weird. What you tend to do is you send an email with a download link, or you just give a download link in the browser or something like that. So the shipping of an ebook is very different. And again, we don't want to make a whole bunch of, a bunch of changes in shipping and a whole bunch of changes in sales because we're then introducing that tight coupling. We're sharing a whole bunch of data from one service to another. And if you think about how that event would look, it would start to get quite complicated. It would have to have all kinds of strange nullability rules around it. So if the address is null, then the ebook shipping address must not be null. And if the Bitcoin wallet address is not null, then the, the, e the credit card details must be null. And you, you kind of get into this kind of nullability soup. And this is a very simple example. You can imagine more complex examples in, let's say, the real world Amazon, for instance. This is a lot more complicated. And you find yourself on that road to saying, you know, at some point, it would just be easier to rewrite this whole thing because it becomes so complex. Now, the thing is, what we've done so far is we've assumed that the order is created when we place the order. And what that means is that the order ID is created when we place the order. But the thing is, we can use another technique. Now, in order to have, in order to, what I've just described are fat events, right? They're events with lots and lots of data on them. What we want to do is we want to slim those down to be thin events. What if each of these events contain nothing but an ID? So when sales publishes order placed, it just says the order has been placed and the ID is one, two, three. When finance says order's been billed, it just says the order's been billed and the ID is one, two, three. Finance can then say, well, I know how to bill for order one, two, three, right? And goes and does the billing. Shipping just says, ah, well, I know the order's been placed for order one, two, three. The order's been billed, order one, two, three. I know how to go and ship it. We've got a chicken and egg scenario though, because if our assumption that the ID is created when we place the order is correct, then how can finance know about the order before it gets the message? And how can shipping know about the order before it gets its messages? Well, let's turn that upside down. Instead of creating the ID at the end of the workflow when we place the order, what about if we create it at the beginning? So what about if we create the ID when we click proceed to checkout? What we can then do is when we select a shipping address, we can actually send that shipping address to the shipping service at that moment with that ID. When we enter our credit card details, we can send the credit card details to the finance service with that ID and so forth and so forth and so forth until when you hit, when you hit buy now, you send your message to sales and because we've done this work up front, sending these details to the shipping service and the order and the finance service, when we place that order and sales does its work, all it has to do is publish an event to say, the order's been placed and here's the order ID. Because remember, we've already told finance and shipping what the details that they need during the workflow. Now, what we can do is they can do their work as they did before, but if we want to introduce a uh, Bitcoin payment, we make a bunch of changes in finance and because it's only receiving an ID from sales, it can say, ah, order one, two, three. I know whether to charge that. I know whether to charge that in Bitcoin or via credit card. And shipping can say, ah, order one, two, three. I know whether to ship that to a physical address or I'm going to send an email for it. Now, the one thing that I'm glossing over here is the UI aspect because it's fine to say that we can just make changes in finance to say we're going to now charge by Bitcoin. But back in our UI, we've got something here which is 
collecting those in, that information, right? It's either collecting credit card details or it might be collecting a Bitcoin wallet ID. So I'm not gonna go into that in this talk at all. I'm gonna leave that to Mauro. So uh, if you're not already aware, Mauro has a, a follow-up webinar after this one on November the 13th, and he's gonna delve into how we do that. But what you've, what you've seen now here is that by using this one special trick of creating the ID at the beginning of the workflow instead of at the end, we can actually thin out and slim out our events to be thin events just containing IDs. Now, those of you here who have worked with databases might be asking a question now. You might be saying, well, what happens if I start that workflow, so I proceed to checkout, I enter my credit card details, I enter my address, and then my partner walks through the door, I suddenly get a feeling of guilt, and I think, ah, you know, um, they're not actually gonna be too happy if I spend this money, and you abort the transaction. Like, you don't click buy now. We're gonna have a bunch of redundant data, right? We're gonna have a bunch of redundant data and shipping for addresses which we don't actually need, and a bunch of redundant payment details which you actually don't need. No, shouldn't something come along and clear that stuff up, you know, that, that, that redundant mess? But you also have to ask yourself, is that, is that data actually redundant? Is the business interested to know which orders are being completed and which are not? You know, is this, is this interesting business analytics? Sometimes it could be. The business might say, ah, I've spotted a pattern here. I think we could do an A-B test to make sure that more people feel compelled to actually go through and complete the order. It can actually be really valuable data. And the thing is that ultimately, if these arose in the database, storage is one of those things where we can generally say it is relatively cheap these days. And it's not even necessarily always data in the database. So we have to be a bit more careful about retaining credit card details they might just be in session state. So the browser closes, the session times out, and it disappears in memory. So not necessarily redundant data and not necessarily difficult to keep when we have to either. Now, why is it that we ended up in the big ball of mud when we tried to introduce service-oriented architecture? Well, the clue is in that initial sharing of data that one little red innocuous arrow that went between data, uh, two different services, started us off on that path which coalesced back to the big ball of mud eventually. So I think this is a good time to start to define what a service is and what a service is not. So first of all, what a service is not. Something that only has functionality, so a calculation of something or validating something, that in itself is not a service. That is kind of the definition of what a function is. It's like, given these inputs, give me some outputs, that's function. Something with only data is just a database. So if you're doing create, read, update, delete on entities, that really just is a database, and that is not a service. And one really important point here is that just because you sprinkle an HTTP layer or uh, back in the SOAP days kind of WSDL layer on top of a database, it doesn't actually suddenly make it a service, right? So our kind of HTTP API over a database is not service magic dust. It's still just a database. All you've done is you've changed the technical access point from a connection string to a URL. A service is the technical authority for a specific business capability. And Really importantly, all data and business rules reside within the service. You can think of this as a special case of a bounded context. Um, if any of you have read DDD by Eric Evans, you know, he talks about bounded context there. He's a little bit looser with his definition of what a bounded context is. The, the definition of a service is, is a little, little bit more crisp. It's specifically the technical authority for a specific business capability. But you can think of it as a special case of a bounded context if uh, DED is something that you're, you're into. And nothing is left over after identifying services. Everything must be in some service. Now, 
if you think about it, this kind of makes sense and follows from what was what we've said, because the code that we write must have some kind of business capability. You know, we are we are paid to write code for some kind of business impact. Um, that's sometimes a bit different if your project is completely failing and you decide to go and learn Rust or something. And you know, I've been in that, that situation myself. But if things are going well and you know you, you are delivering business capability, then all the code you're writing has some business purpose. So if the service is the technical authority for a business capability, it then follows that all code must belong within some kind of service. Now, what this really comes down to is encapsulation. So technical authority gives us encapsulation and business capability gives us business alignment. Now, it's quite interesting to look at something like object-oriented programming because object-oriented programming was actually never really about inheritance and polymorphism and things like that. If you've ever read anything by uh, people like Alan Kay, who first wrote about object orientation, what they described was classes enca encapsulating data and logic inside them, getting messages in, doing some processing, and sending other messages out. That, in a nutshell, was the original idea of object orientation. Now, I guess most of us have worked with some kind of OO programming uh, model before and we soon discovered that objects aren't really big enough right you can't really do anything too interesting with an OO system without sharing some kind of data between objects whether it's with properties or whether it's uh, arguments and method calls you do tend to have to send to share some kind of data around between them so then we can step up to components so in the .NET world you might think of that as an assembly or a NuGet package or something like that. And they're better, you can get a, a higher level of encapsulation between them, but ultimately you still end up having to share some kind of data between different assemblies, for example. Again, via method calls or object properties and that kind of thing. If we then step up to services, there's a fundamental difference because services are Tech, uh, business are uh, business aligned. So services are logical concerns around business alignment, whereas classes and assemblies are technical concerns with physical boundaries. So what that allows us to do is to separate the physical from the from the logical with services. And that's well exemplified if we look at the difference between systems and services. So for example, you may have a mobile app, a backend app, and a Java portal. Now it's very tempting to draw service boundaries along these lines. Now I, I'm sure that I'm not the only one here who's heard the term backend service before, or sometimes front end service. The thing is that services tend to cut along these lines. So what that means is that Service S1 here may have a component which goes into a mobile app. It may have a component which goes into a backend app and this portal at the bottom. And that means that one service could consist of various different technologies. It could be shipping a component which goes into an Objective-C app or into a .NET app or into a Java app. And it means one specific system let's take the mobile app, may consist of components from different services. So a component from S1, an S2, and S3. It's a many-to-many -many relationship. Um, I often make the analogy to Lego. So if you've ever played with Lego, um, you tend to start off with that green board and you kind of have piles of bricks. And I used to organize my bricks into kind of large bricks, medium bricks, and small bricks, or blue bricks, yellow bricks, and white bricks. And then I take bricks from each pile and put them onto the green board and I build a system. That's what it's like to build a system in the service-oriented architecture. Services are logical design time concerns with business-aligned boundaries. Systems are physical runtime concerns aligned along technical boundaries. And if there's 
if there's one thing I'd like you to take from this webinar, it's actually this point. It is the separation of the physical and logical. Right? Services are logical, systems are physical. I think that is even one of those things that's even further down in the root of problems than finding your service boundaries. If you can make this separation, if you can make this decoupling between physical and logical, that allows you to find the right service boundaries. If you don't make that, that separation, it gets in the way of doing that. So now let's have a look at an actual sample domain. Um, this is something which you may find yourself drawing, let's say on a whiteboard. You might have a conversation with your business stakeholders and they might say, well, we've got customers and we've got products. So the first thing you do is you get to your whiteboard and you draw a box for customer and you draw a box for product. And then they tell you that the customer has a first name and a last name and a status and a product has the name and the description and the price. But the thing is, if you start to look at the detail of what's in these boxes, a very different model can emerge. Now, I like to use a, a technique which I, I call anti-requirements. And this is, this is a technique where you can ask some very dumb questions. So you can, the thing about businesses is that they often don't know what they want, but they very often do know what they don't want. And you can take advantage of that. You can ask really dumb questions like, if a customer's first name begins with S, does that affect their status? And at that point, you might get a strange look. And they'll say something like, well, you know, that's just so dumb. Um, not only would we ever do something like that, I don't think anyone in the industry would do something like that. It just doesn't make any sense. Now, when you hear something like that, you've actually struck gold because what the business have just told you is a stable business rule. They've told you that the last name or the first name has nothing to do with the status. So I would then put those things into two different boxes because they don't affect each other. And at this stage of modeling, this is what you're trying to do. You're trying to break things down and you're trying to make piles of different things. You're trying to make piles of related things. Now, customer status there looks a little bit uh, lonely on its own. So you think, well, okay, well, how do, what, what is customer status? You ask your business, what is customer status? And they say, well, we use that to work out the price. If they're a gold customer, we give them a discount. If they give a silver customer, we give them a little bit less discount. And otherwise, we give them no discount at all. So you know that there's something, there's some relationship between customer status and price. So you say, well, I'm going to put those in the same box. I don't know exactly what the relationship is yet, but you've told me they're related. Then you might look at the product and say, well, what's left? We've got the name and the description. Description kind of tends to embellish the name because if it's a Dulux something or a luxury X, we tend to use a description to describe why and why you need it. So we're going to put them in the box down here. Now, this is, again, a very simple example. As you can imagine, in a more complex example, the model that pops out at the bottom after looking at these specific use cases is very different to the model which we have at the top, which we initially draw on our whiteboard. And this is what modeling is about. It's not about nouns. It's not about kind of tangible, identifiable things like a customer and a product. Even though our eyes and our brains are kind of wired to do that, right? that's the kind of thing we like to do. We like to draw a box on the board and kind of get a 30,000 foot view and drill into detail later. But modeling is actually about those behaviors. It's about those scenarios. It's about drilling into the field and not the entity. It's about asking how these things relate to each other. One thing that you should really look out for is when the business say to you something like, customer has a first name if you spot that bit in the middle that has a that's a very very good sign that you're going down a kind of noun based entity based model instead of a behavior and scenario type modeling exercise i'll even go and say it i'll say entities are bad now if you've read uh some of the literature by Eric Evans and DDD and that kind of thing, you might be surprised to hear that. 
But even Eric said, after he read the book, uh, after he wrote the book, he said, well, I wish I'd put that stuff in the second half of the book. Because if you were like me, you read the book and you got all excited about aggregate roots and uh, things like that and entities, and you ran to work and you started writing them. And I read the second half of the book about six months later. So Eric said that he wished he'd put that in the second half of the book instead of the first half of the book. Later on, he actually said he wished he'd just put it in the appendix. And later still, he actually just said he wished he left it out altogether because it wasn't the important message that he wanted to send. And I think to some degree, we've become a little bit um, distorted in our approaches and as an industry in thinking that entity modeling is a thing to, to use at this stage. And I don't believe it is. It's about behaviors and scenarios rather than entities and nouns. Another thing that I'd really recommend at this stage is not to name these things too early. So I actually tend to name them very late or even never name them properly at all or well properly. I would use something like dumb names like red, green and yellow or names of planets or names of animals, it doesn't really matter. The problem is if you name these things too early, it can do one of two things. It can actually prevent you from putting something into a pile. Because you can look at a piece of data and you can say, oh no, that's billing. It can't belong in billing. Or it might lead you to put it in the wrong pile. You might think, oh, well that's clearly inventory. It's gotta be inventory. And especially when you work with more abstract domains that you're not used to day to day, uh, that, can be, that can be actually, it can be easier to not name them earlier. And if you work with more, with more, ident more familiar domains, it can be more tempting to give them earlier uh, names earlier. But try and resist that temptation. Try and just use kind of meaningless names until a point where you, you find your modeling has, has, has moved on much further. Now, let's take another example, uh, insurance. So insurance is interesting because what often happens is insurance tends to get split up between a kind of front office and a back office. Um, the front office tends to be about fear. And I actually gave a talk once in Russia about insurance and they told me that the word in Russian for insurance actually has the word fear in it. So I think there's a degree of truth to that. It's about making you afraid enough of bad things happening that you're gonna buy insurance. The back office is very different. The back office is all about paying out as little money as possible when a claim is made. Now, even that sounds, that, that sounds a little cutthroat, it's really just the model of any business. It's maximum money in and minimum money out, and then you have a successful business. Now, a colleague of mine was actually called in to an insurance company to have a look at their service boundaries and to, and to give them some advice as to whether they got them right or got them wrong. And they showed them this. They showed him a policy service and a claim service, which is very much modeled around the front of, kind of front office and the back office, where the front office sells policies and the back office deals with claims. Now, I don't know a lot about running an insurance company, but I do know that this is probably wrong, and I can say that pretty much straight away. The reason for that is, think about a typical use case. I make a claim, right? I crash my car and I make a claim. What's the first thing that the claim service is gonna do? It's gonna inspect the policy to find out how little we can get away with paying. So that's a whole load of data sharing between the two services. And it doesn't really matter when it's done. It doesn't matter if you publish that policy early on or the claim service requests it from the policy, policy service. There's a whole bunch of data sharing. So these things are getting up very tightly coupled. You end up with lots of red lines going between these two services. Now, try, it's all well and good saying they're wrong, but then you've got to come up with a suggestion for what is right. And I've got to tell you, this is difficult. Finding the right service boundaries is a tough thing when you're presented with a domain. And time can go past where you're kind of bumbling around and kind of, it feels sometimes like you're walking around the dock and bumping into things. You don't really have any idea of where you're going and you, know, you don't feel like you're making progress and the business is saying to you, you know, four days have gone past now. You, know, uh, you haven't told, given us any better ideas yet. You know, what's going on? But you give them a kind of typical consultant's answer, you know, I'm, I think I'm getting somewhere and that meeting we had the other day, that was really valuable, et cetera, et cetera. What tends to happen is sooner or later, you might get, a, you might get an insight, you might get a breakthrough 
and you might realize that, you know what? Home insurance, when, when we've talked about home insurance, we've never really talked about travel insurance at the same time. So you've never told me things like, uh, you know, when the dog chews up the sofa, you show them your canceled plane ticket or you crash the car and you show them your broken TV. I haven't seen any crossover in those use cases. So you think, well, you know, maybe we should be thinking about home insurance and travel insurance and car insurance. So you think, right, I, I think I've got it here. So it gets to the Friday, you know, the week's almost up, but you, you think you, you want to something. So you book the biggest meeting room in the building and you call all the big stakeholders together and you announce a massive, enormous revelation that you've had. You say, home insurance has got nothing to do with travel insurance. And neither of those have got, got anything to do with car insurance. Now, at that point, you might get another strange look. The business might look at you and say, well, how much have we just paid you to come in for this entire week and set up all those meetings to tell us something that we've known our entire careers and the entire industry has known for, I don't know, the last 100 years? Now, again, if you hear that, you may have just struck gold. Because if the business say, well, that's obvious, it's a very, very strong sign that you've got things right. Now, you might ask, well, why didn't we just ask them in the first place? Why did we go through all, all that fact-finding and drinking all that coffee and getting stressed? Why didn't we just say to them in the first place, how is your business organized? The thing is that these three boxes on the bottom are obvious, but the two boxes on the top are also obvious. It depends who you ask. It, it depends on their aspirations. It depends on their, po their position in the company. It depends on their perspective of the company. You know, you might get lucky and they might say we've got home insurance, travel insurance, car insurance, or they might say we've got a policy service and a claim service, or they might say we've got products and customers, or they might say something else. So it's another illustration of the fact that modeling is not a top-down exercise. It is a bottom-up exercise. And people often ask me, well, do I really need to go into all that detail? Do I really need to look at the actual use cases and the behaviors and the scenarios? And the answer is yes, right? And this is not a cheap exercise. But that's what service oriented modeling is. It's a bottom-up exercise looking at the behaviors and not a top-down thing. Now, the whole front office, back office split in the case of insurance is just one example of uh, an organizational boundary. So, this might be a really nice shortcut. You know, it'd be nice to go into a company and they say, oh, you know, we've got sales and marketing and billing, and you go, all right, well, those are your service boundaries, off you go. Now, I think that may have worked at one time. So if you think about the days before we automated, before we brought computers into the business, and before we put databases and desktops on everyone's machines, uh, on everyone's uh, uh, desks, companies, used to hold data on paper. So data access was actually relatively expensive. If you had filing cabinets in different sides of the building, you wouldn't want to have to walk from one side of the building to the other to access the data that you needed for your job. That would be very expensive. So you tended to be organized with your data. You'd be surrounded by the filing cabinets you needed. So you kind of pull a piece of paper out of your filing cabinet, write something on it, maybe send a message to someone else in your outbox, you get a message back in your inbox. So businesses were almost forced to be service oriented because of, because of the cost of data access. Now, what we did was we came along with our fancy databases and our fancy computers, and we put one of these things on everyone's desk. And all of a sudden, data access became very cheap. Anyone could really access data from anywhere. You, know, you just need to the right security flag set, whatever. You know, sometimes you just need to know the right person. So what's happened as a result of that in many of the organizations I've been in is I've noticed that the modern department, the modern organizational unit, is more like a kind of mini kingdom than anything else. It's more a representation of a manager's skill in empire building, you know, building the number of boxes under them in the org chart. Um, one manager leaves, other managers fight over the scraps and kind of claim parts of, of, of the business for themselves. Say, well, we're going to provide that role and we're going to provide that role. 
So it's not really any longer representative of business capabilities. And these things change very often. So uh, one of the companies I worked with uh, not too recently, my organizational unit changed seven, eight times in a year as managers decided to split up things and carve up, carve up the responsibilities differently. So it's a real shame, but for those reasons, I really recommend to be oh, to be to beware of the organizational boundary. It's often not a good thing to use for our service modeling. And it's a shame because it would be a nice shortcut. Now, I did talk, promise to talk a bit more about microservices. So I think a lot of great things have come out of microservices. Um, I do have one big concern, which I'll try and outline to you. Now, microservices are another weapon in our battle against this big ball of mud. So you might read about microservices and think, well, okay, well, I'm going to split, out, uh, split up our system into five microservices. And then you read some more literature that says, well, you know, five microservices is not really enough. Uh, you need to have at least 10, so you kind of split things up a little bit more. And then you might read some more literature which says you need to optimize for deletion. So, you know, you should be able to delete one microservice and rewrite it within a week, uh, that kind of thing. So you decide, well, this isn't really enough. We need to split things up a little bit more. Um, this looks quite nice. I'm sure you'll recognize this diagram. It looks a bit, well, in fact, very similar to the one we saw at the beginning of the presentation. And it looks quite nice. But as we've seen, the business have this habit of coming along and with new requirements. I said, well, you know, I was doing something last weekend, I had a great new idea, and you realize, that, well, we need to make a call from this microservice to this microservice. And again, importantly, is our architectural constraint, our microservices architectural constraint, doesn't say that we shouldn't do this. Each microservice has a defined interface, it encapsulates some behavior, and this is what they're designed for. They're designed for one microservice to be able to use another microservice in some kind of collaboration. So you make the call and everything works. Sooner or later they come along with another requirement and you find yourself doing the same kind of thing again and you've seen this picture before. No one intends to make a mess, but given enough time, months, years, whatever, you may find yourself going back towards this kind of situation where you've got arrows going between all different microservices. Now we've seen that we may as well take the lines away. We've seen that we may as well take the boxes away. And we're unfortunately, we're back to this big ball of mud scenario. Only this time, again, it's a big ball of mud with a difference. You've rolled this out onto 100 Docker containers. They're all talking to each other over, over the network. You've spent the last six months writing this incredible Kubernetes-based deployment system, which can roll out 10, 20, or even all of these things at the same time, because you've found that you've had to do that quite often. What you've ended up with is a kind of big ball of mud microservices edition. And again, that's a shame because we've reached for something which was supposed to help and we've ended up in a much worse situation than we started with. What we want to have is logical services with business aligned boundaries and we want them to be very loosely coupled, ideally as we've seen with just IDs going across the wire. Now within these things, we have physical components. As we've seen, we might pick out a component from here, a component from here, a component here, and put it on our Lego board to build a system. Within one of these services, we might have components for different reasons. Now, let's say that this service is something to do with bank accounts. One of the things it has to do is produce bank statements. Another thing it has to do is lock bank accounts for fraud. Now, producing bank statements is not really, it doesn't really have such a tight SLA. You know, it has to go, it should go out on this day of the month. If the worst comes to the absolute worst and it goes out the next day, it's not the end of the world. So you create a, a component for statements and you might put that on two machines for high availability in case one goes down, the other one picks up, um, should be enough. Whereas fraud has a very different SLA. If you detect fraud in an account, you pretty, want to, you pretty much want to lock that account instantly 
because you're going to be liable for the money at the end. So our fraud component, we might roll out onto, um, I don't know, 10 Docker containers. We might have it elastically scaling. We might use Kubernetes. We might use all that nice stuff we've read about in microservices literature. If you want to call these things microservices, I won't, I won't be too upset. Now, I don't really like the word microservice because for two reasons. Micro, it implies that size is the important thing. And service, it's another overloading of the term service. I prefer to call them autonomous components. But you could think of these as microservices because they very much fit what you may have read in the microservices architecture. My big concern with microservices is that they get in the way of us finding these bigger boundaries, these logical service boundaries. Not much you'll read in the microservices architecture tells you about that. They te it tends to conflate the physical with the logical. So a microservice is a process, is a repo, is a thing that you roll out on its own, and that is a service. In service-oriented architecture, a service is a logical boundary. It is a business aligned boundary. The components themselves, they are physical things. They are technical concerns. Now, you may think that in this box down here, are we not building a mini ball of mud? Now, I'm not going to say that that's impossible, right? Using any architectural technique with enough determination, you know, you can create a mess in any way, you know, whatever kind of technique you use. But I will say that it's less likely. Because as we've seen, we split things up within these logical boundaries for other reasons. We don't split, we, we split them up for SLA concerns. We split them up in order to ship them into, to, into separate physical systems because the physical is different to the logical. If you look at the box on the top right, um, you can see that there's actually only one component there, right? So the service is the same as a physical component, right? They are one and the same thing. But it's just by coincidence. It's just by architectural coincidence that it made sense for that service. It's not an architectural constraint to say that one service must be one physical component. It's just by coincidence for that particular service. So uh, that brings me towards the end. Um, as I've said, uh, Mauro is going to be running a, uh, the next uh, webinar on November the 13th. And he's going to dive much further into a specific example. And he's going to talk much more about the actual messaging that goes between the services. He's going to talk a lot more about the composite UI uh, that we very briefly touched on earlier. So I didn't go into, it, into that at all. Um, but you can think of that Amazon UI as a composite of different services. And Mara is going, to to, is going to go into that in a lot of detail in his, in his webinar. So that's the kind of like the, the main unanswered question that I've left in this webinar. And that webinar is actually going to attempt to answer that for you. Uh, look out for an invitation in your inbox tomorrow. Uh, we'll be sending it out uh, with today's recording. So that brings us uh, to the end. Uh, one last thing I'd like to say here is that Service-oriented architecture and service boundaries, like all the other things that you hear about in, in uh, software development, is no silver bullet, it's no golden hammer. It's not applicable for absolutely every situation. Um, one good example is if you're working in a startup, startups don't really know what their businesses are. They're, they find a few years finding that out. So for instance, it took Facebook a number of years to find out that it's actually just a media company. Right? It puts eyeballs in front of media and sells those eyeballs to advertisers. So it's a kind of typical media company model with the advantage that they don't actually create any media. So it's very lucrative. But in the startup, even if you were to go down the service-oriented route from the start, or you were to go down the kind of more build whatever route from the start, when you find out what your business is, you're going to have to rewrite either way. So as I said earlier, service-oriented architecture and finding your service boundaries is, a, is a, not an inexpensive exercise. It's, it's an investment uh, which does pay off at the right time, but you have to be using stable business rules. And you have to be in a business which is able to identify itself as what it is as a business in order for this to work.
So that brings me to the end. I hope you've found that uh, enjoyable. I've really enjoyed talking to you. And now I'm going to hand over back to Mauro and we're going to have a look at some questions. Thanks, Adam. We have a few questions that came in uh, before the webinar through email and a few that were asked live uh, during the webinar itself. So I'll start with one that came in earlier from Steve. And the question is, after attending UDI's uh, ADSD course, uh, I'm of the opinion that correct service boundaries pro promote grid performance, isolation, and maintainability. But there's always a cost. In other words, there's no such thing as free lunch. On one of the downsides, appears to me, is that creating UIs become more complicated and correct SOA is predicated on being able to do a UI mashup of data from different services. The example given on the course was that the Amazon homepage, the same you used probably. My question is, am I correct that SOA mandates a UI mashup? And secondly, what is a service in real terms? In particular, if it contains the UI, that must the UI component be kept with all the rest of the services source code in the same solution? Or is it a service, a logical construct we are free to have the UI component wherever suits. Right. So, um, so first of all, thanks, Steve. Uh, that's a, a really good couple of questions there. Um, with regard to the first point, um, you're absolutely correct uh, that service-oriented architecture uh, is not a free lunch. Um, as I said a couple of times, it is a it can be quite an expensive exercise. Right? It is a time investment. It requires one of the important things is to have access to the people who can actually tell you about the business um, and their time is expensive as well. So it is an investment which needs to be considered and you need to consider when it's the right time. Now, with, your, with, your, uh, with regard to your points about the UI, um, so that ties into some of the things I've said in this talk. And again, you are absolutely correct that you do, a, you do require uh, what you refer to as a kind of UI mashup. Um, which we usually uh, refer to as a kind of composite UI. Uh, and this is where each service contributes something towards that UI um, so that you can make changes across the whole vertical stack. So if you're introducing something like uh, Bitcoin payment, you introduce it across the whole stack in one single service and you take advantage of the fact that physical is decoupled from logical and that you build a component from finance which gets shipped into the UI to give that UI to give the UI part of that. Now, as I said, I glossed over that in this webinar, but that is pretty much exactly what Mauro is going to cover in his webinar. So, to get deeper into that, um, I thoroughly recommend uh, coming onto Mauro's webinar in November. And the last point about source control. Um, Again, because services are logical constructs, because they're logical things and not physical things, it kind of frees you up to do what makes sense for that service. Now, I, I would say that if you're seeing components from two different services in the same repo, that's a smell. Because they shouldn't have any coupling between them if those are true service boundaries, which means you've got basically two things with zero cohesion between them in the same repo. So I, I, I don't know if there's a reason to ever do that. So I would say that naturally you would expect um, components from different services never to share a repo. As for a specific service goes, you can kind of do what makes sense for that service. You could decide to put the entire service in one repo. You could try. You could um, decide to put the, the, the front end component in its own repo and some back end components in their repos. Um, it really just depends what makes sense for that service. So I think once you've found your logical service boundaries, it actually gives you a little bit more freedom in that respect. Um, but looking out for that smell of two services having their hands in the same repo, because that, 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 doesn't, that doesn't seem right. So I hope that answers the question. Um, as with all the questions I'm answering here, I am going to follow up offline anyway, um, so you'll get a chance to, to ask me more. Back to you, Thanks. Mara. Thanks, Adam. So there's a, a very interesting question coming in through the Q&A uh, panel. How do you organize development teams 
with services and systems. Who owns which part and how are new features to a system prioritized by each service? Right, that's a that's a that's an interesting question. Thanks for that. So um, this is something that is is actually an important uh, aspect. So um, in, in fact, we, we we sometimes run a workshop, a two day workshop, where we we do go into this as well um, as a as a, as something to to augment what we're saying here about service boundaries. So I think that what you can do in an organization is you can have separate service teams. And those service teams, so for instance, you, you might have, say, a billing team who work on the billing service. And because of the physical and logical separation between um, uh, the, the, the actual technical components in the service, what that implies is that you may have to have, um, I don't know, a front-end developer, um, a back-end developer or developers and uh, people with different skills. So you might have, you might, with front-end development skills and knowledge of Objective-C or whatever, Xamarin or whatever it's used these days, and .NET people. So it's kind of a cross-skill team. And they must be able to deliver each component which that service needs to ship. Now, in a smaller organization, that can become more a case of wearing the right hat at the right time because you may not be big enough to say, well, you know, you four people are the billing team and you four people are the sales team and you six people are the uh, finance team or shipping or whatever. So it may be a case of recognizing that we have these different services and I have to wear a different hat depending on which service I'm working on. The challenge with that then is to avoid the temptation to sometimes just start coupling things together because if you've, got, you've got hands in two places. Now in terms of prioritizing, so feature, prioritizing the features to a new system, um, I don't want to go into this too deeply now because it's a kind of another hour or two hours on its own, but we also have this notion of an IT ops service which kind of takes care of more technical concerns. So I don't know, logging, infrastructure, um, things like that. And what is often useful uh, then is to have an IT ops team as the kind of the gateway for features. So they, they're the kind of place where features arrive and they kind of prioritize and decide you know, where these things belong and they might say, well, that's an entirely a sales thing. So they kind of liaise with the sales service and say, well, sales service is going to deliver that feature in its entirety. Well, sometimes they can have responsibility of coordinating things between two, two services. Those things would not be technically coupled, but they might have some kind of other reason to be delivered at roughly the same time. That's some kind of marketing launch or something like that. Now, I've introduced this new term, IT ops, which I'm not really going to explain. Um, if you want to know more about that, please follow up with it, with me afterwards. I can get a I can actually get um, a couple of videos together for you from Udi's uh, Advanced Distributed System Design course, which can help you out out with that and explain that further. Back to you, Mara. Thanks, Adam. So there's another question from Andreas. How would you combine the different services parts into the system parts? Don't you need some sort of framework which combines the different service parts? That, that's also a really good, great question. Um, so I think the, the most obvious example of combining a system uh, from components from different services is actually the UI. Um, this is the part where ultimately you have a thing that looks like one thing to the user and it might be a web UI It might be a mobile app um, Whatever it is now clearly then you do need some way of combining those components and In fact, this is something that we're playing around with now a particular software. We have some kind of um, uh, Kind of labs products to, to do this and this is something again that Mauro is going to cover in his webinar in November. So if you want to see a really good solid example of that, um, again, I would really recommend coming onto that next webinar because that will actually show you a concrete example of something that actually helps you to do this. Back to you, Mara. Thanks again.
So one question from Christian Jagger. I would be interested particularly in the perspective of trying to move a legacy application to more modern patterns and practices. It's awesome to start with a greenfield uh, project, but often folks don't, don't have that luxury. Right, so that's, that, that's also a very good question, the one, one that comes up quite often. Now, first of all, I'd like to just address that point, that, that, that term greenfield. So um, this is often used um, uh, when we talk about um, patterns, practice, approaches, frameworks, is that it's all very good in greenfield. What about legacy? Now, one thing I've come to learn over my career is that greenfield is a myth. There's not really such a thing as greenfield. It's kind of like a mirage that we create for ourselves on the horizon that we one, like, one day like to work on, but we never actually find it. And if you think about it, it, it kind of makes sense because you know, when is it that you come into a business and they know exactly what they want, they have nothing, they just want you to build it. That doesn't tend to exist. We're, I've already talked a bit about the startup example. Startups don't know what their businesses are. They invariably create some level of big ball of mud. And only when they realize what their business actually is, do they have a chance to start rewriting and start to make things better. Elsewhere, you might be asked to write a new system virtually every new system you write with will have to interact with legacy systems somehow. So it, I would never call those things completely greenfield either. You've, you can have a bunch of legacy to deal with from the start, no matter how you start. So what that means is that we're always dealing with legacy systems. So what I'm talking about right now is something to apply to a legacy system. This can be tough, right? I'm not going to say this is ever an easy thing. What, what it sometimes means is that you sometimes have to take your legacy system and you have to carve off bits of it. So one thing we like to talk about quite often, in particular software, is the strangler pattern, which is where you take this kind of like nasty old thing, you gradually carve a bit off into something new and nice, and you carve another bit off, another bit off, and the end, in the end, in the end that, bit, that nasty bit in the middle gets strangled away into nothing. What that means is that you can actually end up with a very awkward situation while that's happening. You know, I sometimes use the analogy of you, you, you're trying to t take a bus and you're trying to take this, you know, like a school bus or something, and you're trying to make it into a plane. And for a while, you're going to have this school bus traveling down the road with one wing hanging off the end of it. You know, and it's going to look awkward and it's going to maybe look worse than it looked before. But the point is you're taking steps towards carving off those things and introducing nice things around the edges until you get rid of the thing in the middle. And someday your bus will cease to look like a bus and it will actually take off and fly. So again, it's something I could go into in a, in a, in a, in a lot more detail. Um, it's something you could almost do a workshop on you know, for a day. Um, but again, um, I'd be very interested to, to follow up on that. And I may be able to find some useful resource on that. Maybe one of you these videos uh, which can talk about that in more detail. Back to you, Mara. Thanks, Adam. We have a few unanswered questions, but I think we're over time. So we'll follow up all, with all the questions that we haven't been able to answer via email in the coming days. I'd like to remember you all that my colleagues and myself uh, will be speaking at a number of conferences in the next few months in Zurich, Rotterdam, Berlin, Warsaw, Malmo, and even Regina in Canada. And go to particular.net slash events and find the conference near you. That's all we have time for today. On behalf of Adam Ralph, this is Mauro Servienti saying goodbye for now and see you all on the next particular live webinar.